And while I'm getting myself straightened up, I, I have to give a, a, a loving rebuke to Pastor Darrell. I don't know what he was talking about, about having a, what, you tired of Thanksgiving? <laughs> tired of the turkey? I just want to remind him, you do know the turkey died for us. <laughs> yeah. The, the pig died. The greens, all that. It made us sacrifices. Uh, that was just blasphemous in my eyes, but okay. But if my daughter did the same thing too, she's tired of it. So maybe it's just, I'm just older. I don't know what it is because she's giving the turkey away to the dogs and I'm, she need a whooping. That's just, anyway, I've got a good two hours to go. Now, people look at me like, wait a minute, wait a minute. But you all can help me get out of here early. So I'm going to look to you for some interaction. Not a whole lot, but some interaction. I want to see something on your face. I want to give you something that I think that I know for a fact is going to help you. And so, now, if, if I don't feel any feedback, well, then doggone, I'm just going to preach to this computer, and we'll take two hours. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Some of y'all want to go see the game. I want to go see the game. So, if you are in this category, and I just want you to be honest, if you're in this category, if you have ever been depressed, if you've ever worried, if you struggled, if you had some issues, if you felt like you have ever been attacked, if you are being attacked, if you anticipate ever being attacked by someone or being attacked by yourself, if you just struggle, if you got some issues you intend on having, not through your own desire, but know you're going to have some issues in the future, this is for you. Now, if you don't think this is for you, well, then something's wrong with you, and this is definitely for you. And so what I want to do is I want to do something that could be a little bit dangerous. That is going from different texts throughout the scripture and kind of putting together. That typically is a recipe for bad Bible exegesis. That's bad Bible interpretation usually. But I am going to put it all together. They seem like they are unrelated texts, but I'm going to make them relate not just for the sake of the text, but for the sake of you. And so I want you to also, as we go, notice if you can see a theme. Now, before we get too far into it, I'll let you know what the theme is in a little bit. But hopefully this is going to help you to grow and overcome in your faith. And so what I want to do is first start off in the book of Esther. Esther chapter 3, verse 5. Now, Esther really ought to be called the book of Mordecai. It's really not so much about her. She's a part of it, but it really magnifies and showcases the faith of her uncle Mordecai. Mordecai has taken her on and has really raised her like a daughter and so she's married to the king. Depending upon which version, your version, the, the name of the king might be Xerxes or Ahasuerus. Uh, his Hebrew name is Ahasuerus and so your version might say Xerxes, same person. Now, it starts off speaking about, I'm sorry, not start off, but it speaks about a man named Haman. Haman hates Mordecai and his issue is historical and a bit racist because his great, 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 and I don't know how many more greats there needs to be, grandfather is a man by the name of Agag. He was king of the Malachites, and he should not be around because the prophet tells Saul to kill all the Malachites, and apparently he doesn't. As a matter of fact, all the Jews were to get rid of them, and so now we have to deal with uh, Haman later. Just as a little side note, y'all do need to realize that past sins can show up. You don't, dis, you, you disobey God. That might not be you taking care of that or having to deal with the ramifications. It might be your children. It might be your grandchildren. Some of you all might be dealing with some stuff that maybe your parents or grandparents did or did not do. And so I would beseech you in biblical terms to take care of what you're supposed to do. Be obedient to God right now. Amen. But that being the case, Haman hated the Jews. And so if we go to Esther chapter 3 verse 5, and this is weird by the way. This is the very first time that I'm actually using a laptop to preach. What was it, 30? Wow, 30 years ago. The first time I preached, it was a, it was a book. It was a Bible. Pages in it. Now I, I use it. I refer to it every now and then, but I'm going to be honest. Typically it's, it's one of these gadgets on the phone. But it, so it's just weird, but verse 5 of Esther, chapter 3, Haman, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He, he had learned of Mordecai's nationality 
So he decided that it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews through the entire empire of Xerxes. He hated the Jews. And so getting a little backdrop of his history or his family history, you see why he can't, he could not stand. But by the way, God had already told them because of your disobedience in me, I'm going to cause other nations to hate you. I'm going to cause those very same folks that you're supposed to drive out to keep them in the land. What's happening today? That is what God said is going to be a result of your disobedience until I fix it. I'm going to make you look to me. And with that in mind, he's going to do the exact same thing for even his own children. Not to the same degree uh, or with the same ferocity that he does with the Jews, but also with us. And so here we see Haman cannot stand Mordecai. Mordecai, though, we learned something about him. And I would, I would encourage you to read all of Esther. But Morde Mordecai, uh, we see that Mordecai seems to trust God more than he trusts anybody else. Mordecai seems to have a uh, favorable view about God than he does about either Haman or the king or really anything else. And so how much does Mordecai, is he hated by Haman? So much so that after the king, after Haman is invited to a banquet with the king and the queen, the only one, it's a place of honor, he still can't get over the fact of how much he hates Mordecai. So much so that him and his wife and friends have come up with a plan to build a gallows. That's where you hang somebody that's going to be 75 feet hot, hot. I've never actually experienced or witnessed a hanging, but I don't think you need one that's 75 feet tall. I don't find, so what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to make it visible. He's wanting to make a spectacle. He wants to embarrass him as he, as he hangs him. He wants to make Haman, I mean Mordecai, an example. Now, there are some people who love hating you more than they love their own life. Some people love hating you more than they love their life. Matter of fact, some people's life is based on hating you. Anybody ever felt like that? Your whole life is just consumed about hating me. You hate me. Well, I guess the word, what is it? Hater? You a hater. It's a bunch of haters. Isn't that something? If we could export one thing in America, we, we could export hating. We do some, some shit, and we do it ourselves too. It's just what we are. It, it, mom, apple pie, and hating. No, that's the American way. And so that's what we see here. This man hates Mordecai. But if you read the story, Mordecai really isn't bothered. Why? Because it depends on who's doing the hating. There can be somebody that's got some plans for you. Matter of fact, truth be told, there's a lot of folks who've got some plans for you. Do you know how many plans have been put together for you to destroy you, to hurt you, to harm you? It really doesn't matter, though, who, who, who's making the plans, even if it's the greatest enemy, because if the king has favorable plans for you, well, then it just doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter at all. You can hate me, but if you're about this big, if you're a two-year-old and you mad at me, that doesn't do me any good. That doesn't bother me at all. I could care less. If I give my grandkids a spanking, that will end. What are they going to do to me? Nothing, right? And so it does matter who has a plan for you. And so Mordecai seems not to be bothered about this. Why is that? Well, I want to turn to Esther chapter 6, and I want to read you something. In chapter 6, verse 1, at night it says, at that night, verse 1, the king had trouble sleeping, so he ordered an attendant to bring the book of the history of his reign so it can be read to him. And what he reads is, what he's doing is he's going back and he's checking the record and he's seeing something that Mordecai has done. The king notices that this person has stopped a plan to kill him. There were two men that wanted to kill the king and Mordecai forced it and these two men are hanged. Well, the king is oblivious to it, but he goes and he checks the record and he finds out and he says, what should be done for these men, for this man that's done such a thing? And he's saying, well, who's out in the court? And his attendant says, well, Haman is out there. Why is Haman there? Because Haman shows up because he wants to announce his plan to kill Mordecai. You know that 75-foot gallows? We'll come back to that in just a little bit. But that 75-foot gallows, he's coming to bring that plan. And so the king says, what should be done to a man who has done such a thing? Well, Haman, the, ha the hater that he is, is thinking that the king is talking about him. Well, you should give him a signet ring, give him a parade, run around town, show him off. I said, well, do that very same thing for Mordecai. And so now Haman, his jaw just dropped. He doesn't know what to do. And so before I move on, all of that now, guys, was my introduction. Because I want to submit to you that when you find yourself in any kind of problems, 
any sort of situation, I want you to do one thing. I want you to check the record. Check the record. Rather than seeing what Naaman, I mean, Haman is doing or what he's got planned, isn't it better to know what the king is thinking? Yeah. Oh, by the way, what did the king do? Check the record. We have a king, by the way. I don't know if y'all know this or not. I just want to just drop something on you in case you didn't know this. We got a king who checks the record. Matter of fact, this particular king, like, unlike this one, he couldn't sleep. Our king not, never sleeps. And he checks the record. So you might want to, it would behoove you to give him something to check. Give him something that when he goes to look at things, oh, by the way, the Bible tells in the end he's going to judge you for everything that you've done, good or bad, thought or in deed. Amen? Give him something to check. And so when he checks it, he can reward you even now and then. But he wants to reward him but the enemy is against him. Well, so what? That's, that is Mordecai's thought. That's Mordecai's thing. So what? Now, me, if you ever get a chance to spend time with me, you're going to find out that I have kind of a so what sort of attitude, meaning that I don't really let on how much I care because truth be told, in many cases, I really don't. Why? I won't go through my whole story, but I've been through a whole lot enough to know that. So, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? What, what can you possibly do? So, and, and, and honestly, guys, I mean that. So much so, ask my wife, how, it, listen, so? That, so, and? Well, what about this? And, so, why? Because when you start checking out, you know what, I'm almost about to get into the sermon too much. Let me hold back a little bit, because I want to I wanna save that for later. Now, I'm not a hooper. I'm not a hooper, I'm not a shouter, but I just, I might start today. I might start today. But Mordecai understands who God is, and in spite of the circumstances, is never bothered, never depressed. Now, again, all of that is my introduction. So now we can go ahead and, and jump into this. After this happens, after the king checks the record, Mordecai, I'm sorry, Haman is bothered. But Haman still wants to destroy all the Jews. And to make a long story short, it comes about that Esther is talking to the king, and she lets him know about this plan and tells him that it's that man, uh, Haman, who has devised his plan. The king is furious, and he comes back in, and he sees uh, Haman pleading with her, but he's touching her, and he's upset. So they grab him, yank him out. What do y'all think that he was killed on? That 75-foot guy. Sometimes you ain't got to worry about what folks mean for your destruction, because that might be the very thing that they die on. And so oftentimes, the, the, the plan that the enemy has for you is the very same death or failure that God is going to cause himself. Not every time, but the point is, I don't have to worry about what the enemy's doing as long as I know what he is doing. Now, I said I'm going to put some stuff together because I want to go to a, another story. Doesn't seem like they're related, but they, I promise you they are because what we want to do is we want to check the record. Now, how many of you all are familiar with the story of David and Goliath, right? You don't even have to be a Christian to know that story. It's David and Goliath. Matter of fact, that's kind of what we talk about when a, a, a really, really, really good team is playing against a really, really, really not so good team. And we say, it's David and Goliath, right? The team that shouldn't win versus the team that should win. So can I ask you guys a question? Why was everybody so afraid of Goliath? He was a giant. Okay. What else? He was strong. What else? He was a warrior. Okay. Can I ask you guys a question? Now, I want y'all to think for a second. This is where we can, you can help me get out of here early. That way I don't have to go back into the text and do a whole lot of searching. This way we can get out of here an hour and a half early. Can I ask you guys a question? Who did Goliath ever kill? I think about that. Yeah, nobody. Go throughout the scriptures. You won't find anything that he's ever done worth it. He's just big. All his, his whole claim to fame is He's just big. I mean, go check the record. However, as we go to 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verse 4, the Bible says that then a champion, I'm sorry, I'm reading out of NASB, I'm going to NLT, then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the force of Israel. The word that's used there for Goliath is Ish Bahanin. All that is is a single champion. That is, if, if my team, if my nation wants to fight your nation, me against you, the winner, that's who wins. We, we ain't got to worry about everybody else dying. It's just one. That's it. 
So what do they do? They pick the biggest guy they could find. Apparently the slowest guy too. Somebody with not very good reflexes because David did not have an issue with that. Why? I wish that they would have done what, what I'm asking us all to do too. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. Everybody is bothered. Everybody is afraid. The Philistines got a whole lot of... Have you ever seen somebody... I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this. I was at Texas Tech and we had this sinner. Uh, I won't even say his name. I won't say his last name. His name was Bernard. I won't say his last name. I won't tell you his last name is Jackson. But <laughs> this dude, six ten and a half, two seventy, and this was you know Shaq was in college at the time too. So everybody like the next Shaq. Can I tell you this guy was horrible. This guy was at the end of the bench, and that was on a team, a Texas Tech basketball team that wasn't very good. Six ten and a half, two seventy, two whatever, and could could barely dunk. Just big for nothing. That seems to be, that seems to be who Goliath is. Look what it says. Look what it says in, in, verse, in verse 25. When David shows up, the Bible, they say to David, have you seen the giant? Have you seen him? Seen what? Just, he's a giant. That's it. David said, yeah, I see him. I can't miss him. Literally, can't miss him. He says, he comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. Well, that's interesting since this giant you're talking about has never, as far as we can tell, has ever killed anyone. Now, everyone is doubting him because of they, their perceived view of Goliath. However, instead of checking the giant's record, yeah, he's never lost a fight, but he's never won a fight. He's zero and zero. He's like... He's like everybody at the beginning of the season. He's like all you Cowboys fans at the beginning of the season. Zero and zero, you got a whole lot of hope. Notice what happens when the king asks David, are you sure? This is, a, this is a giant. David says, no, why don't you check my record? Why don't you check my record? But, but notice how David puts this. David isn't just saying just check the record of me. Notice what he says. Go to verse 35. He says, I'm sorry, 34. But David persisted, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defiled the arms of God. Now, uh, other versions in the Hebrew let you know that it is God that delivered the animals into his hand. So David's not just saying, check my record, but check who was behind my record. Check who, I'm, it's not just me just doing this, and that's why David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that comes to defile the people of God? And that's kind of how you look at it. You need to be someone that checks the record. Typically, though, let's be honest, we don't like to check the record. We like to look at our issues, and our issues become bigger than what they are. And it's not just us. It's even people in the Bible do the exact same thing. One of my favorite stories, because it just shows how we are as people, is when you look at those, two, those men, those, I don't know how many men were actually in the boat with Jesus. Now, they had been with Jesus for a while. And they get in the boat with Jesus, and Jesus is tired. Tired of them, tired of people, just tired. Y'all just wearing me out. I'm, Jesus is in the boat, sleeping. He's earned a rest. Jesus does it from time to time, go off by himself and get a rest. He is sleeping. Now, we have, a, we have a, uh, the Son of God, God in flesh, who is literally in the boat, and he's sleeping. But apparently these men have forgotten his record. Now, they've seen a lot. They have seen a lot, and I'm coming, so I'm, I'm coming down your alley just a little bit. But they've seen a lot. They've seen him do all these miraculous things. But what do they focus on? The current giant, the current issue, the winds, the storm. Now, the Bible doesn't declare that anyone has died in this storm. They just declare that it's a storm. And it's frightening to them. And these mighty men of God, these chickens, are in the boat with God. Th think about that for a second. Literally right there, he's not, he's not tripping. He's not fussing. 
he couldn't be worried because he's asleep. But they're panicking. Master, as the King James Version say, carest thou not that we perish? Jesus, Jesus, wake up. Somebody wake him up. And this is why Jesus is upset when he gets up and he says, basically, as though you, you all have no faith. Haven't you been with me? Check the record. All that I've done. Now, let me come down your alley. Yesterday's storm. Today's storm. Next week's storm. Go and be honest with me. What are you likely to do? You're not likely to check the record. Well, you might be, but it's whose record you're going to check. It's, it's whose record we go. How is it that the God that creates the waves and the winds, who can put him to rest, we don't, we don't, we don't focus on him, but we focus on the issues. Now, I want to I wanna show you how much you should be checking the record. I want to show you how you should, or how you even can adopt a so what attitude. I don't mean so what like you, yeah, I don't really care. You care that stuff is happening. You care that you might not make as much money as you want. You care that you wish that you were in better shape and so forth. You care, but to what degree? Everybody has this at some point in time. The problem is, it doesn't seem like we're really trusting God. But I want to ask you, or invite you, beg with you, plead you to please check the record. And you go, well, what, well, what record, Corey? Because I've trusted God for my salvation. Okay, fine. Well, now trust him for your life. Trust him for your living. Because if God has designs or plans for you, have you checked his record? Has he failed? If, if, if he says, let me, give you, let me give you a story. Something that Jesus said. In John 14, he says, do not worry, do not trip. Fix your heart. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he says, if I'm going to prepare a place for you, then who am I coming back for? You. In my father's house, there are many mansions, dwelling places, rooms. And if I'm going to prepare it, you, I want you to understand that in the Jewish tradition that if that happens, when he's doing that, he is obligated to that bride. So he's coming back for you. But what do we do? Panic? Worry? Where's Jesus? What's going to happen? So let me help you out real quick. By, matter of fact, before I do, before I do, before I do, let me turn, let me, let me go to 1 Peter 1. Now, we typically read out of NLT. I'm going to read out of NLT, but I'm also going to read out of the NASB. I want to point something out to you. In the NLT, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, something that you need to see vitally important, because again, I want to not just check any old record, I want to check his record in our lives. He says that all praises be to God. Matter of fact, I'm going to have to read out of, out of the, the first portion of the NLT and the NASB. In the, in the uh, NLT, it says, all praises to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Now in the, in the NASB, it says, according to his great mercy, who has caused us to be born again. The word that's used there, anagonesis, which is he is the one that's causing you to be born. If you are born again, you didn't do that. It is literally, it is literally what he does to you. It's him because he sees that you no good, you're going to mess up every time, even with the Spirit in you, you're going to mess up. So what does he do? He does the work first. He has to, as Jesus is saying in John 3, he causes you to be born again. Why is that? Well, if we keep reading, notice what he says. He says, we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay, meaning you're going to get exactly what he has for you. And through your faith... God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Verse 6, so be truly God, I'm sorry, glad, there is a wonderful joy ahead, even though, look what it says, you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials, verse 7, and here it is, these trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Now, I want to I want to point to something in the, that you don't really see in the NLT. The NLT is more of a thought-for-thought thought translation. It's kind of on the lines of the NIV, 
the King James, New King James, NASB, ESV, those are, those are word for word. There's a word that, that you need to see here. It's this word that we have for proof. It doesn't really show up in the, in the, in the NLT, but this word proof is from the Greek word dokimos. It's only used twice in the New Testament. The other time that it's used is in James 1. So in James 1, some of you all are familiar with this passage. It says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you counter or encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. That word for testing is the same Greek word that's used in 1 Peter. That word just simply means proof. In other words, the trials that you go through and you coming out is proof. Put another way, it gives you a record to check. What do I mean by that? How many of y'all have had some problems in your lives? Even if you too, you, got, you have some issues. Somebody didn't fill my bottle, ain't nobody changed his diaper on me, something. Or if you're 30, if you're 40, if you're 50, you've had some issues, right? Did any of those issues cause you to cry? How many of y'all worried about those issues? How many of you stayed up? Matter of fact, it might, Lord help you if it's one of your kids. Then you're really worried. You almost wish that you could just die for whatever your child is going through, right? I'm like, you've gone through so many things. Maybe you've been beat up, shot at, put in jail, homeless, whatever, abused, all those different things. You've gone through all those different things. The problem that we have is we keep checking the wrong record. There is an account of every single thing that you've gone through in life. Problem. Because you keep looking at every single thing that you've gone through in life. Why is that a problem? To be looking at every single thing that you've gone through in life? Because you're missing the point about every single thing that you've gone through in life. That is, God has brought you through every single thing that you've gone through in life. You think about whatever it is that, that, that you're in, here's how I know that God has delivered you from all those things. Just, you're here. You're here. We, we, this is why he calls us sheep, because we we, sometimes we just do dumb stuff. We think, that I'm literally here. God, why did you take me through all of this? You did all of that and this and that and this and that and that. And why? And God is like, shut up. I brought you out. I literally brought you out. You here. Anybody ever had a medical emergency? You here, right? You here. So who did that? Check the record there. Anybody had a family mark? One of your kids just went off the range? They're here. Check the record. Have any of you all ever had a financial problem? Maybe I lost a house, lost a car, lost a job, lost this, lost that. Did anybody sleep outside today? Check the record. Maybe you don't have what you wanted to have, but I can promise you, if you check his record, you can have what he wants you to have. Check the record. It really is that simple, because what he's trying to do is, as he says, that word that's used there, God doesn't haphazardly just choose his words for no reason. That's why that word is there. Proof. Proof. Now, let me just tell you the problem that you're going to have. By the way, Jesus, or the Bible makes a statement in John 20, speaking of all the signs, all the things that God has done. It says in John 20, 30, it says, The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones that are recorded in the book, you know, the record. But these are written that you may continue to believe that Jesus, they're written, all of these things that you can go and check in the Bible are written, just a few things, not all, just a few things so you can go and check the record. But even if that ain't enough, go down that list of all the things that you've been through, that, 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 and check the record. Now, here's the problem, and I'll close on this. Here is the problem, and to have a conversation with you, have a relationship with you, wants to speak with you, wants to be with you. Y'all believe that? Well, how often do you speak to him? When do you speak to him the most? Is it typically when trials are happening? Oh, God. Oh, matter of fact, you go, some of y'all, now, I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not into the whole tongue stuff or whatever, but there are times where you just feel like, Lord, if you hear my tongue, something. I want you to hear me. Lord, I'm going through something. I'm struggling, right? You cry out and you cry out. But if God, this is just me, if the only time I can hear you, if the only time I can spend some time with you is when you go through something, then you want to have a kind okay, well, guess what you're going to have? And oh, by the way, all I'm doing is giving you uh, some more proof. That word, I'm giving you some more proofs 
some, some more things that you can check. And what do we do? As soon as he delivers us, we shout, we're happy. Five minutes later, God, you don't never do nothing for me. And so why would he stop all the trials from coming? If you learn, if we learn to trust him. Yeah. Or if we just check the record. Instead of bragging about what you've been through or complaining about it, I should put it, how about just boast about what he's done? Yeah. What Paul said, he said, I can boast about a whole lot of things, but what I would rather boast about is all the things that he brought me out. Because I know I'm weak, but when I'm weak, I'm strong. Why not? Because I'm weak. Because it's him that I lean on who's brought me through. Yeah. And so when you sit there crying, and when you whine, and then, and, and Lord, have you come to me to look at you. <laughs> <laughs> y'all pray for my wife and my kids. <laughs> because I, I I could be, I could be a little bit more compassionate, but I know what she's been through. I know what she's been through. She knows what I've been through. We got a serious record. I'm talking about a serious record. And so we check, not what we've been through, but what he's brought us through.